Uh, today, uh, one of the things I absolutely love about running is how inclusive it is and how open it is. Um, I started running uh, my first year of graduate school. And uh, luckily for me, it's a sport that requires very little in the way of coordination, skill, et cetera. Never been an athlete really before. Uh, but my first year of grad school, I needed some diversion, some challenge outside of the classroom. Uh, and I started running. I trained for a 5K, turned into a half marathon, turned into a marathon, and just kept going. Um, I love running for uh, the diversion, the uh, connection it brings me to other people. My third date with my now husband was a 10-mile training run. Uh, my brother looked up his times before we did that date and called me up and said, Bethany, don't do that. <laughs> that is going to go horribly wrong. And I was like, you know what? He seems, he's fast, sure, but he seems like a really nice guy. And that was a good bet. Uh, one of my other favorite runs, we did a 5K the morning of our wedding uh, with the wedding party. Um, I love what running brings to my life. So I also really enjoy the, um, the community aspects of running. Um, and as, a, as an indication of that, and I also have kind of a love story both around running too. <laughs> so it was because of this Boston Marathon that I ran um, in 1999 that I met my current partner. Um, and so uh, he had learned that I would run the Boston Marathon. He was about to start running uh, training for Boston Marathon, and so a mutual friend put us in touch. Um, and, and that's how I met him. And then a couple years into our relationship, two years into our relationship, we decided to run the Boston Marathon together. So this is the uh, medal from the 2004. When you ran together, was it together the no, whole time? No, we can't do that. OK. No. Just, just asking. Because there's not only a community aspect to it, but there's also <laughs> a little bit of a competition aspect to it mm -hmm. that I also enjoy about running. So here are, are two of my medals um, from the Gay Games in 2006. Nice. So I took the uh, second place. So I got a silver medal for the 10K and then a bronze medal. <laughs> Um, for the half marathon. So I enjoy the community aspects of it, but I also enjoy the competitive. The, yeah, the competitive aspects a little bit. <laughs> um, but running for me um, is people dream. And, and when people dream, their thoughts get organized. Um, and, and for me, that's what running is. So it's when I'm running that, I'm, that, I'm, that, that my brain is doing all the work that it needs to do to put things in the right place and the right combination and structure and everything like that. Um, and so running is integral to me. So people who know me well know uh, when I haven't run yet in a day because I'm more agitated, um, irritable. Um, but if I do a run first thing in the morning, that I'm, I'm, I'm more even keel. I mean, I'm never truly even keel. Um, and today, we're really excited because we have a chemistry professor. Um, uh, Brent Iverson is here. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what, how he incorporates running into his own classroom. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, and uh, this is interesting because I'm here today and I'm going to be talking about running because um, of my wife. So over 30 years ago, I met my wife and our first date did go horribly wrong. <laughs> she could run 15 miles. I could not. I tried. Um, I survived barely. And I've been running ever since. But one of the things that that taught me was the importance of being fit and healthy as an adult. Because if I have one thing that I've learned, it's that being successful is not successful if you're not healthy. Hmm. And students come to the university with a 20-year warranty on their bodies. It's pretty much OK for the first 20 years. After that, what they have to find out is that you have to work at it and that you've got to have good personal habits put in place or you're not going to be healthy. You're going to have a dreaded meeting with a doctor somewhere along the line, and they're basically going to say, sorry, it's too late. There's very little you can do. What we want to do is we want to prevent that. So um, about 15 years ago, I started talking about this in my organic chemistry class. And I'm talking to mostly pre-meds, usually about 500. And I make a very simple point. And that point is they're working their tails off to become successful mm -hmm. in any way that they want to define that. But I'm going to define it as not successful unless they are healthy and they are fit. And in adulthood, you cannot take this for granted. And to me, that's what running is. And so I like to think that what I teach in my class is important. But the only emails I get afterwards are, you know, I forgot all of the aldol reactions and the Claisen mechanism, but I'm still running. And because I'm still running, this has truly changed my life, and I really appreciate it. And so it's really just been now part of the culture of my class that they know they're going to run a race. Hmm. And I know that that's one of the things that I would like to do here, is I would like to inspire your class mm. to beat my class. Right on. So um, last spring, my class ran the Longhorn Run. 
And when we ran the Longhorn Run out of class of 500, I had 141, I think it was, students who ran the race. Um, and most of those students, it was the first time they'd ever considered running. Hmm. And that's really the people that I think it's important to reach, the students who take their bodies for granted. You can do that now. You can't as soon as you leave the university. And so I want to motivate those students who are thinking, nope, I'm never going to run. Please be quiet. Let's talk about the chemistry. No, I don't want those students to realize that the most important thing they will hear in college is what my wife taught me, which was being fit is being successful. And so that's what we're going to try to get across um, today. Wow, that's great. Um, so taking uh, the, the running from the community aspect to the classroom, um, now we want to share with you a video um, from, for, for whom running is really personal. Um, so let's go to the video. Featuring the biggest names and the best stories in sports. The following is a presentation of E60. Sports Matter. A single father and his only daughter, starting the day like they do any other. It's not cooking, right? There's two questions I ask. Can I keep running? And am I still fit to raise a kid? Because one's how I get through the day and the other one's why. These runs aren't about the distance covered or the finish lines crossed. For Iram Leon, they're about what lingers in his brain and what lives in his heart. For him, the running is about surviving. For her, it's about remembering. What? If something goes wrong on that surgery table, am I gonna have had a kid that doesn't remember me at all? Hiram Leon was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, one of three brothers raised by a single mother. When he was eight, the family moved to Kermit, Texas, 200 miles north of the border. There, Hiram found his passion. He wanted to run tantos miles of days without failing a day. So he ran and ran and ran all the days. In third grade, I was running through the hall and I stepped into the principal's office and I got spanked for running in the hall. <laughs> and uh, this, that's actually when I got put on the track team. By high school, Iran was captain of the track team. By college, he was running a mile in under five minutes. He married his high school sweetheart at 20, and five years later, they had a daughter, Kiana. My life did not change anywhere near enough after having a kid. I can count on one hand the number of times I changed the diaper. I didn't meet my father till I was 15. And so I had no concept of what being a father was or should be. Time passed, the father worked, and he ran. But in the fall of 2010, when Aram was 30, he fainted during a lunch and ended up in the hospital. A doctor came in and said, look, you just had a seizure. And they said, you have some kind of brain tumor. We're going to admit you. And then they walked out of the room. And I'm all by myself. Iram's tumor was diagnosed as a grade 2 diffuse astrocytoma, a cancer located in his left temporal lobe, enmeshed in the language and memory center of his brain. A doctor gave him the prognosis. He said, look, as things stand, you're probably not going to make it to 40. I cannot think of a single moment before or after where the reality of the fact that I was going to die became so clear. An operation to remove as much of the tumor as possible would prolong his life, but it carried a risk. 
it could permanently damage his brain's ability to form new memories. If something goes wrong on that surgery table, if I have the seizure at the wrong place, what if I have a kid that has zero memories of me? I didn't want to create the kind of hole that I'd grown up with. What can happen to someone who has cancer? They could have seizures, or if it's bad, they could, like, die. In March 2011, Iram underwent surgery. He woke up the next morning to a different life. I was sitting there trying to watch TV shows and couldn't remember what had happened moments before. I was losing my own way in my own conversations. Life became more difficult. Iram's memory deficits cost him his job as a probation officer. And three weeks after the surgery, his wife filed for divorce. Not very difficult. No fue el cáncer. Pero lo más difícil fue cuando ella se fue. Era ver a Kiana llorar en su cuarto. Por su mamá. Y era ver a Irán llorando. There was a night where I literally got drunk on tequila and smoked a cigarette. And I'm not sure anybody, including myself, recognized me during that time. Pero él siempre decía, voy a estar bien, voy a estar bien, tengo que estar bien por Kiana. Despite driving restrictions and his memory issues, Iram wanted and received full-time custody of his daughter in the summer of 2011. He wanted to give Kiana memories that might never last in his own mind. It was the start of a new life. Daddy? Yeah. You want me to Yep. There was one night, as I was getting her ready for bed, putting her down on her bed, and she's like, Daddy, can we, can we paint our toenails? It just meant, whatever it takes. I'll paint, paint her toenails? That's, that's what it takes to get Canada so I'll paint my toenails every day. Ahora irá a cambiar mucho. Ahora es, tiene que ser mamá y papá. Uh, Daddy, mm -hmm. do you know an easier way to do it? How many easier way to do it? Well, it's not exactly easier, but... An old passion brought the father and daughter even closer. They trained and entered in local races. There were five Ks then a half marathon, then their biggest goal yet, 26.2 miles. He's fast and he runs hard. I can like see him sometimes and he sweats. <laughs> March 9th, 2013, 2,000 runners left the starting line of the Gusher Marathon in Beaumont, Texas. My original thought was like, how cool is this? Just because Kiana's going to be with me. Well past the halfway point of the race, Iram wondered where the other runners were. I turned to the, to the cyclist and I said, how far back am I? Because I couldn't see anybody. It was a long highway. I'm like, how far back am I? There's no one ahead of you. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? It's like there's no one ahead of you. And that's when it hit me. I am going to win a marathon. What do you remember about that race? Uh, they were people cheering, and we won. Just two years after undergoing brain surgery, Iram and Kiana Leone crossed the finish line of the Gusher Marathon in first place. And I thought, this, this is as good as running. 
and life gets. Now, two years later, Iram is still running with Kiana by his side. It's a race against time, but he's made peace with that. Oh, nicely done. Because he knows he'll be leaving something behind for his daughter. ¿Cuál es lo que él quisiera dejar como un recuerdo que él estaba allí siempre, que él luchó? Y, y ha estado luchando para estar con él. There's two questions I ask. Can I keep running and am I still fit to raise a kid? Because one's how I get through the day and the other one's why. There's no question I'm going to die, but I'm just trying to get some of the living done right before I do. So we're really excited today because we have Aram with us. So Aram, thanks for joining us today in class. Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, so first, tell us, Aram, how you're doing today. You know, I, uh, I had an MRI a few months ago. Everything's stable. They've let me start driving for about a year. Um, more importantly, uh, my daughter just did her first 10K uh, a couple of days ago. She uh, did a tr night trail race, and uh, I was hoping she'd do it in a couple of hours, and she did it about an hour and 20, 27 minutes. An hour and 27 minutes? Uh, yeah, 20-something. 20, 20 I don't remember That's the exact. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, she was passing adults all along the way with the... So. She didn't beat you, did she? I think she outsmarted me, but you know, I was pretty close. I was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about why running is so important to you. You know, it's uh, it's just it's my therapy. Probably how much I, I run tells you how bad I need therapy. Hmm. But I was, you know, I was listening to you guys talk about uh, about your proposal mm -hmm. and how you partnered up. And my first marathon, I, I signed up for it to, to do it with the girl I was with, and it was on Valentine's Day. And we didn't do a single training run together. We didn't run it together. You know, we just high fived at the end. It's no wonder we broke up. I should, I should be more like you guys. <laughs> you have to plant those roots, yeah, right? Yeah, During I those just... training runs, and that'll get you through actually yeah. race day. So didn't, didn't think through it enough. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, some of the things I love asking runners: What's your favorite run? What's the favorite run? You, you know, my favorite my favorite run is always the next one. You know, no matter how good or bad the last one went, my my favorite race is always the next one. There's been some good races, but you know, I always try to have a, a race on the calendar. I have total respect for people who just train for just to be to watch their figure. But I need I need something to keep me going, so I always have a couple races on the calendar, and my favorite's always the next one. Nice. And you'll do races from 5Ks all the way up to marathon still? Yeah, I don't. I, apparently, I, I don't. I have ADD or something. I, I, <laughs> I've done a 10K, a 5K, and a marathon, three, literally back to back to back, and uh, you know, it's one foot in front of the other. How does your training schedule change? Um, well, when you when I when you do that, it's uh, the coach certainly gives me looks about my my intelligence. When I <laughs> but I do a track workout every Tuesday. I do a hill workout every Thursday, and then if I don't have a race, I, I do a long run that kind of corresponds to whatever the next race is. So, Iram, I'm sure that there are days when you're in bed and and you just don't even want to get out of bed. So, how how do you find the like internal strength and fortitude to like? Make yourself get out of bed, put on those running shoes, and, and hit the trail. You know, once upon a time, I, I put off brain surgery to run a marathon. You know, I had, I, I, I had just, I, I woke up uh, with a seizure on a Friday af uh, afternoon, and we went to the hospital, but the biopsy wasn't going to be till Monday. And I'm not very good at sitting still. So I, it was the longest I'd ever sat around, or laid around, I guess, it was a hospital bed. And so I asked if I could uh, go running Sunday night just around the hospital grounds, and I I might have actually left the hospital grounds. <laughs> I needed to get out of there. And so I, I just kind of think back of that moment, you know, if you put off brain surgery to run a marathon, you really can't come up with any excuses for being lazy on any given morning. So what did your doctor do to you when he found out that you did that? Uh, actually, I think he told his, the nurses about me, and it, it might have shown how, how much was wrong with my brain, but he was happy about it. So, wow. so no excuses? Well, yeah, I mean, you got to keep going um, because it... it I don't know. I don't, I don't know how any day is going to go, but you you get to choose some part of it, and so for me, that running is always that choice. Hmm. And and that's a little bit of, of, about running for me, right? Like there are days where we clearly have a lot going on, and and on those days, I just get up an hour earlier because if I don't run, then my day is going to be off, and so you might as well just bite the bullet, get out of bed early, and and go for the run. I mean, yeah, I've done it in the morning, I've done it at lunch, I've done it at night, and it, it seems no matter what, I, I both sleep and dream better on the days that I run. 
So, uh, you know, Aaron, one of the things that's really interesting about this story is that I've had a number of students over the years who unfortunately were diagnosed with cancer um, subsequent to being in my class. Every single one of them told me that running helped them during treatment. Every single one. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that you've discovered that this has been really helpful to you. I think it's, in, in fact, you've inspired a number of students you've never met who have really lived this life and it's really improved them in, in many ways. And so um, there's a whole lot that's going on here, especially with, with your life and what you're able to show. But I think the impact that you have on others to show them a way to deal with really difficult physical situations is just truly inspirational. And it just, it really confirms to me, every time I think of you, I just think, no excuses. I don't care what my students say about why they can't run. I'm just thinking, of course they can. If they choose to do it, they can run, and they will benefit from this in ways that they can't possibly imagine. You know, I was, I was at an event where somebody asked me when, when I started running, and, and a little kid, probably 11, 12 months old, get, gets up and ran across, ran across the floor. I was like, right there, just like everyone else. <laughs> I just didn't stop. And so, you know, Kiara just did that, that first 10 kid. I, I think you have to not stop. I think that's a, a very natural instinct. I don't know when we turn it off, but I, I'm glad she has, and I'm glad I have it. So. Well, thanks so much for, for being here, Aram. We really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me. So that's a really personal story, but running can also happen not only at the personal level and the community level, but also the global level. So um, now we're going to watch a video where, where running has taken on uh, an, an entire global phenomenon. Growing up as a child in Burundi, the first thing I did every morning before the sun would rise was get one of our plastic container and head down the mountain to fetch water. Finding the water was never a problem, but it was always dirty and needed to be boiled. When I returned home from school at the end of each day, I picked up the container again and went back down the mountain. Every day, always the same. I did not take my first sip of water from a good, clean source until I was in first grade. Burundi has a history of a conflict going back to the early 1960s. But for most of my childhood, there was no war. Things changed when I went off to boarding school as a teenager. And over the next two decades, the country went through a very difficult time. War, genocide, children losing parents, parents losing children, and millions of Burundians waking up each day in a great poverty with no real way of getting out. But there is another side of my country that you don't know about. Burundi is amazingly beautiful. To me, it's like Hawaii. We have trees that produce some of the sweetest bananas you could ever test. Mountains that reach over the clouds. The tea and the coffee that is grown is one of the best quality in East Africa. And along the western border, swimming within Lake Tanganyika Lizai, over 300 fish that can be found nowhere else in the world. Living among all this beauty, however, are citizens who have no access to clean water. Because of because their foundation, lives are being transformed. When we finish a water system, the immediate impact is the average distance a family walks each day goes from over four miles to just 400 meters. Only one lap around the track. Children are getting to school on time, happy, hydrated, with clean clothes. Health has greatly improved, and health clinic reports to us that waterborne illness have vanished.
And because the workers for each system are the future beneficiary, jobs are being provided, and a greater sense of ownership has been created. I give my time, my talents, my financial, because I've seen results. My friends, join us today as we continue our mission in transforming lives in Burundi. Right, so that's a video about some of the global aspects of running. And we're really excited today because we have Gilbert with us here in the studio too. Um, so Gilbert, tell us how the race, how the logistics are, are going for this year's race. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you this morning. The race, the registration is going really well. We are, we are over 1,500 right now, which is a great sign. We are ahead of the schedule. Great, great. Uh, so how are some of the ways in which, in which the, uh, the race last year has helped Burundi even, even just in the short year that, that, that has gone on since the last race? Because of your participation last year, uh, at this moment, I'm very proud to tell you that we have helped more than 40,000 people are getting clean water close to home. And thanks for your participation. And... Uh, this year, we have set the goal high to 6,000 runners, and I'm hoping uh, thousands of you will be able to join. That's a model of life being transformed. When I talk about transformation, sometimes we, it's harder to, uh, to understand. By you participating, um, someone in Burundi, a family, will be able to have water for life. It does not cost that much either. Hmm. It costs $25. What can you do with $25? Go register to change a life of someone. Wow, so if we get 6,000 runners that are, are running the race this year, tell us more about the positive impact that that can have back in Burundi. Uh, to give you uh, just a simple scenario, $25, uh, it helps a family to get clean water to a family. So uh, we've done the math based on the, uh, uh, the number of women we helped. Um, so the people will be getting clean water. Children will go to school and become better educated. They will be not, de they will not dehydrated. They can focus on the studies. Hospitals, clinics, they will have water. And villages, uh, we employ people. By building these projects, we employ population, we employ the people, the local community. They get paid to, um, to install this, the, the water. So really, you're talking about a transformation of villages and uh, the communities. Wow, that's great, Gilbert. Um, this year, uh, you're focusing also on the global aspects of the, of the Burundi, of the run for water. So you're having people participate who don't live in Austin. Um, and, and so tell us a little bit about those efforts. Global, uh, global run is one way to grow our race. Um, so for those of you thinking you'll be traveling, you're going to see your parents, so no. You can run whatever you're going to be. Um, you just run the race. We send you the bib. That's it. So Global Run, it's the best way also to reach out to the communities. Uh, so get your uncle, get your cousin, get your teammates, get your high school, run the race, change the life of someone in Burundi. 
Wow. So, so let me get this straight. So if, if one of our students out there who really wishes they could participate in the run, but they're not going to be in Austin, so let's say their brother's getting married back in Dallas. So what they should do then on the day of the race when, when we're running in Austin is they should get a community together in Dallas. Yes. And they can get their own bids together and they can run the race and, and it'd almost be like they're participating with what's happening here, which is helping Burundi in Africa. Yes, we will send them. We're so lucky we team up with uh, Map My Run which will be able to get those, uh, uh, the results. We send them the bib, we send them the t-shirts, and life has been changed in the Burundi. That's great. So right at UT, we, we claim that what starts here changes the world. And, and I can't think of a more real way that that can happen this semester in this class than if we have people participating in this race so that, so that kids in, in, in Burundi can have clean water and they can get education and jobs. Right, but starts here changes the world. Yeah, I mean, it's changing the world, but it's also changing individuals' lives, too, who are running. I mean, I can't think of a, a more important reason to run For sure. than those two. Right. I would like to, um, I was listening earlier to your conversation, and why I run, when I'm, why I'm asking you to run. I run because, for me, it brings me joy. Running, it grounds me. It connects me to people to the world. And when I run, my mind is clear. My mind is free. Whether you had a good morning or bad morning, you just go out and run. It will clear your mind. You come refresh and your day will be uh, awesome. So um, when I was young, some of you know, I was involved in a really, really um, accident where I lost 30% of my body. I was told I would never, never run again. After three months in the hospital, I was able to run. And now I'm able to give back to the community. And some of those people are trying to hurt me. Running has helped me to regain my strength and be able to forgive my enemy and move on. Move on. Really, you don't have any excuse not to run. Register to run, change your life for someone in Burundi. You know, and, and the big part of, of what I like to see about this is it's a transformation at many levels. It absolutely transforms lives in Burundi. It's also going to transform the lives of our students if they learn that running is really important for their own health. And I keep coming back to that because it's something that is the most important lesson they can possibly learn at a university is to take care of themselves. And this is such a great way to connect with something that is so powerful because you have turned hate and evil into love and forgiveness and triumph. I mean, there's no other way to say it. What you have accomplished is, is inspiring at so many different levels. Um, you know, um, you mentioned it really quickly. People in the running community know that Gilbert's associated with the term run with joy. Um, that's, that's Gilbert. And he, he lives it and he means it. And I have to tell a personal story because um, about a year ago, you had an anniversary. You were here for 20 years. And so the way Gilbert celebrates the anniversary is he gets his friends together and has them run 20 miles, um, <laughs> one mile for each year. And so I, I have to say there was a personal interaction in the middle of that run that I was fortunate enough to be on with you that kind of says it all. And so when Gilbert runs in Austin, he, he doesn't just choose a path that's flat. So we ran over Mount Bunnell. <laughs> and then we ran down the other side. Most of you have probably not been down the steep side of Mount Bunnell. We get to the bottom. I'm thinking like everybody else, oh, we'll just find some flat way to limp back to the, to the beginning and we'll be done. This is about mile 16, by the way. He says, no, we go back. So we went back <laughs> up the hill. And at that very moment, and I was thinking to myself, how can I get out of this gracefully? Because I'm not going to climb up that hill. He comes by me and he says, run with joy. And I did. Um, it, it changed the way you think about things. I went flying up that hill. I was fine. And it just, you just have a way about you that I hope these students can perceive with you just in, in the studio here, that they can understand what you can really do and, and what you bring to us. Um, it's, just, it's just true magic, and I hope that they can experience that for themselves. And the best way to do that is to be part of your run. They will be part of something that is so much bigger than just Austin. It's so much bigger than just you even. It's, it's just powerful. Thank you. I hope you participate, yes. Great. So what's starting here is hopefully changing the world.